Great. So today, I'm going to talk about using surveys to better understand your users, or clients, or customers, or visitors, whoever interacts with you on a digital basis, or even analog, if you're doing surveys in a mall. That this, some of these would still apply. So whatever word you want to use instead of users would still apply. So real quick about me. That's me. That's my four-year-old daughter. Um, I'm the founder of something called Quiz and Survey Master. It's a plugin for WordPress that allows you to create quizzes and surveys. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Florida, where I teach web development. And then I'm the co-organizer of WordCamp Jacksonville. And you can find me on Twitter there. So we're going to go over a lot of different parts of surveys. But one of the things I want to talk about first before we get too far into surveys is something called bias. Now, almost every survey you ever encounter will have some bias in it. And when I say bias, what I mean there is that there's something about the survey that makes users answer in a particular way or maybe not answer at all, which is going to skew some of the data. Now, almost all surveys and every survey results that you ever read is going to have some bias in it, even surveys that you create. The goal is to avoid that and limit it as much as possible. So in this case, it can occur from anything, from overall design of the survey. It can come from the users of how the type of users you're marketing towards. It can come from how you word questions. There's lots of different factors into whether you have bias in your survey or not. So a simple, very basic example is if you had this question, do you drive recklessly? Maybe you want to know if people are bad drivers. If you ask someone, if I go up and I go, hello, sir, do you drive recklessly? He's not going to say yes. No one says yes. I don't know. Maybe you are very confident in your recklessness, but most people are going to say no. Instead, you might want to say something like, how many speed tickets have you had in the last two years? Or something like that that's a little bit more factual. That's not going to say, oh, no, I'm not a reckless driver. No one's going to say that. So this is an example, a very basic example of what bias could be based on how you word your questions. So one of the main types of bias that I encounter is user bias. And what user bias is having things worded in a way or surveys set up in a way that is biased towards certain types of users of certain experiences or background or life. So here's an example that the majority of the young adults in the country you use their mobile phone for most of the web usage they do. So most of the emails they read are on mobile. Most of the forms they fill out, they're using on mobile. So if your overall website design and your survey design does not work on mobile, then you're probably going to have a lot less young adults answering your survey, which will mean your data will skew towards older generations. So that's a very, another example of how bias works. Does that sort of make sense? Oh, yeah. At least what the concept is. Or I'm going to go over some more bias, but does everyone understand the concept of bias before I go? OK, great. So another example is that sometimes, depending on your type of survey you're creating or your industry, you might ask for some sensitive information, maybe a particular location they live or certain activities they partake in. And maybe there are certain demographics that try to avoid answering those type of questions. So by having that in the survey and making it required, those demographics may choose to not complete your survey, which will skew your data away from those type of people. So for example, this is why the census has heavily debated the type of questions they include in there. If they include questions about citizenship or things along those lines, they have a less percentage turnout of people completing it. So to avoid those situations, they purposely word questions in a way and remove some questions that will prevent people from answering it. So that's how the user bias can be affected based on their background and not your questions themselves, but what's going on in the user's life. And that's something you want to think about when you craft these surveys. So a couple of things about avoiding user bias. You can do a few different things. One is always, this is Web Design 101, is testing your survey or your site on almost any device you can. This would include things like cell phones and tablets and computers. This would also include things of accessibility, such as screen readers. You would want to check these various things to make sure any demographic can complete your survey. That's a really big, important factor. Another thing is if you're going to have sensitive fields and you have to ask for it, being very clear that it's confidential and it's not being used in certain purposes and you're not sharing it with someone, that'll at least alleviate some users who would, be, who would be deterred when they see those kind of questions. And then lastly, there's also certain demographics that whereas time is very precious to them, and they might not want to complete a random customer survey. So for example, you might you probably get survey questions all the time from like Walmart or Amazon or companies that maybe you're like, ah, I don't need to answer that survey. Now, if you're the type of person, in this particular case, the example is single mothers working multiple jobs, there's lots of demographics that are very time constrained. 
And they're, they're not really encouraged to answer some random site survey. And that is where incentives could come in to help get some more of those type of de demographics to complete the survey to make sure your data does not misrepresent by not having those demographics there. Does that sort of make sense? So in addition to user bias, I also want to talk about question bias. How you word your questions, like the do you drive recklessly question earlier, can skew the data vastly. So you want to be very careful of how you phrase the questions. So this example here is a question you might have you might have come across at some point in your WordPress journey. There's this WordPress plugins are crashing sites and having stricter review processes by the WordPress Foundation is a must. Do you agree? How that's phrased, almost everyone has encountered the white screen of death, where you've updated a plugin or you activated it or something, and your site crashes. That's it. That's a situation. There's 70,000 plugins in the repository by so many different plugin developers. That's something that could happen, and a lot of people have encountered that. So when you word a question quite this way, you're going to go, wow, I've encountered that before. You're going to get a lot more yeses than you normally would, just because they have had that frustration. Even if they may not entirely agree how it's phrased, they're going to, it's going to immediately censor, oh, that, they're going to make them a little angry maybe. They're going to remember that time where they lost some money. So yes, that is a terrible situation. So this would be an example of data that's going to be skewed because of how we worded the question. Now, most of the time, will be you should be wanting to avoid this kind of bias. But there's a lot of organizations and companies that will purposely introduce this bias to get the results they want. This is very common at politics. When you go to one news site and a new, another news site, and they'll say, oh, these are the results, and it'll be almost the same topic, and yet one will skew heavily one way and one will, because they've wor they purposely worded their questions to get the results they want. So that's another area that they're, so they're using question bias. They know it, and they're purposely using it to skew the data to show their users, oh, this is what people are saying, when it may not be reality. So that's another thing to consider. Now, questions can also be about topics and are worded in a way that the user may not know of. So depending on your demographic, depending on your industry, this may or may not apply. But it's all, if, you, if they come across a question and it's like, oh, how many times has your site crashed? Or how many times um, have you used this plugin? And if they're not familiar with it, and there's no, like, I don't know option, and there's no option there for other things along, they're just going to randomly select one, which is going to hurt your data and the integrity of your data. So you always want to have something like, I don't know, or other, or something along those lines. So in case they encounter that, there's some option they can check, check that's not going to be completely random that's going to hurt your data. Even if it's something that you're um, sure that it's pretty much one way or the other, like certain maybe demographics, maybe you have like age ranges or things along those lines, or you're pretty certain everyone should fall in here, you should still have that other option just in case someone goes, well, I don't really quite fit in here, but I could fit here, and so that you don't want to get that situation. So you should almost always have that extra option. So here's that first, oh, wrong way, sorry. Here's that question, the plugin question, reworded a little bit differently to try to get some of the bias out of it. So instead of before, I said WordPress plugins have the potential to crash a site. Knowing this, how do you feel about the review process by the WordPress Foundation? And instead of being a yes or no, it has, it should be stricter, it's fine as is, or it should be less strict. Does that Sort of makes sense how the difference between our first version where we were saying, oh, everything's bad and we should make it better. Do you agree, yes or no? Whereas this one's kind of like, this is a fact. What do you feel about the process overall? And there's a, a better, worse, or equal. Does that, sort of, does that make sense, the difference there, and how this one reduces some of the bias? Okay. And then like I mentioned a second ago, you should always try to include some sort of opt-out choice, such as I don't know, or undecided, or maybe an other, depending on the type of question. You should almost always have something like that to prevent people randomly choosing options. So now that we got bias on the way, I want to touch on one other thing that you might use some of these surveys I'm going to go over in just a moment. You could use towards segmenting your audience. So this is more for mostly marketing purposes, but it could be for slightly other purposes. The power of segmentation is that it allows you to send relevant information to certain types of users within your audience. And using surveys, there's a couple items here, but using surveys, you can segment your audience based on a couple topics. So for example, maybe I have a large audience, and I'm writing about um, surveys, and I'm also writing about business. Not everyone's going to read, want to know everything I'm writing about. Maybe they only want to read about surveys. Maybe they only, only want to read about business. 
Well, you can segment these audiences, and you might have come across this term in marketing automation or some of the other marketing sessions, where you can segment and only send them the, the information they're interested in or that's relevant to them. Well, you can use surveys to achieve this. So for example, this is a fairly straightforward one. If somewhere in your survey you have something like, which of these topics would you like to see us write more about? Then you could have those different answers. So if you had maybe surveys, business, and my pet cat, and they, whatever they select, you could tag them in your marketing automation software. So if you're using such like MailChimp or um, ActiveCampaign or any of those other ones, you could theoretically have each of those answers tied to a different tag. So you would, they would get that tag so you could send them relevant information. So this is one that we use at Quiz and Survey Master. Well, one of our questions is, what kind of quizzes and surveys do you use? So we might have like education quizzes. We might have um, lead generation quizzes. We might have general surveys. And based on what people s click there, we'll send them different types of marketing campaigns or even guides or introductions to those different types of usage. So this is another one. Out of the following features on the current roadmap, which one do you need the most? So then we can also use our segmentation here. So if someone says, oh, they're using this, whenever that feature gets close or we want to get more info, we can send information directly to only the users that are interested in that. So that's another way we could use some of these questions within our survey to kind of segment our audience to send them relevant information. Does that sort of make sense? I know that's a little bit more marketing than we're going to go with the rest of the talk, but I just wanted to mention that since that is a very common usage in surveys, at least on digital versions. Yes? Do you find it more beneficial to, to ask specific or open-ended questions such as which of these would you like us to write more about versus rank these topics? It depends on exactly what you're trying to achieve. I'm going to go over a couple different types of surveys in just a moment. So if I don't answer it over the next several slides, we'll revisit it and I'll answer it then. Thank you. So the next several sections here, I'm going to go over a couple different types of survey categories and then give you some usage and then some example questions. The first one is the user research survey. And this is one that you've probably encountered quite a bit at various companies. And this is the one that kind of goes, well, who are our users? Who's our demographic? Like, what do they want? What do they do? And that's what you're trying to achieve with this kind of survey. So you might have answered a Walmart survey or an Amazon survey or one of those where you have to kind of say about your demographic and what you do, maybe your average income, various aspects. And that's their version of their user research survey. They're trying to understand their audience. And these are ones that you probably don't see that often. These are usually ones that you see very rarely. They're sent less frequently because they're very long. And these are also ones that usually have, on average, about 20 questions and take around 10 to 15 minutes to complete, depending on your audience and what you're doing. It could be much longer. It could be much less. There's a lot of wiggle room there based on what you're doing. But those are some of the averages. So these are the type of surveys that you would focus on getting what the user, who the user is and what they need. So if you have a blog and you're writing about cats and you have quite a bit of audience and you want to write, maybe know who your audience is, you would send out a user research survey Maybe once they sign up, and that's the only one they'll ever get, maybe it's yearly, depending on how your users and how your demographic works. But you would find out maybe who they are, what, where they live. So you'd maybe have a country question, or if you only focus on one country, maybe you have a state or province question. Um, you might have a question about income, if that's something that matters to you. You might have questions about what they use. So for us, we want to know like how many websites you manage or things along those lines. It would be kind of a way for you to understand who your users are. And you would have a, a collection of different closed questions and some open answer questions. So for example, we want, since this is only occurring once a year, we want to get to know them. We have a couple, usually we recommend a couple open answer questions, things about their life or their, who they are, things along those lines. But you also want some closed answer questions so you can kind of see analysis and an aggregation. So for example, our question on how many sites do you have? We do that one as closed answers. We do like one, one and then two to five, and then maybe six to 10. And that way we can say, OK, we want to see, we want to learn about our users who have you know, six to 10 websites. And then we can review the open answer questions within that category. So by having that collection there, it's easier to aggregate some of the data and then only look at the open answer questions of certain people that fit a certain characteristic. Does that sort of make sense, the combination there? So some example questions would be, what for us, we say, what led you to look for a quiz or survey plugin? 
So these kind of questions like what led you to our product or what, um, what were you looking for when you come, come across our site, things along those lines help you understand where these people are coming from and what problems they're trying to solve. This is another fun one we like to include is what is your biggest pain point when it comes to X? And X is maybe what you're trying to solve, what your company does, what your client does, anything along those lines. And then maybe if you're marketing to people who have websites, you might say, how would you describe your website? This would be more of an open answer question. Uh, and then you would also say something maybe, what nearly stopped you from using us? So most of the time that when we use it and when we recommend it to our users to use this type of surveys, maybe if you have an email marketing campaign, so you have maybe someone where you, people can subscribe to your site or subscribe to your product, this would be usually the first email or maybe the first, somewhere in the beginning funnel of your email, have a link to this survey so you can understand your user. Who are these new users? Where are they coming from? What are they doing? Thinking, things along those lines. And then we don't usually send another one of these out ever to the same user. Now, if you're in a demographic that people are maybe growing, maybe you're in a teaching market, or maybe you have a lot of people who are changing their lives quite a bit, depending on the industry you're in, you might maybe do this yearly or every two years, something along those. You wouldn't want to do this often because then no one's going to answer it. You're not, you probably wouldn't want to answer a 30-question survey every single week. You probably wouldn't even do that every single month. So we usually recommend once a year or maybe once per user, depending on your industry. You could probably get away to twice a year, but then you're going to probably start seeing a drop off of users completing it regularly. Does that sort of make sense? Does anyone have questions so far? Um, I will be posting it on Twitter, and then um, it will be on SlideShare as well. Uh, but you'll only be able to find that through my Twitter, probably. So that would be the best spot. So in addition to user research surveys, the other one is user experience surveys. So user research usually focuses more on their demographic or how they found you, who they are, what they're doing. Whereas experience is what, how they experience with your brand, your product, maybe your whatever you're selling, um, things they've read about you, things along those lines. So this is more of getting feedback on usage or implementation or interaction. Depending on your, what you do, this would be more about their experience with you. So it allows you to gather some feedback about the user's usage and perception of your site and product. These are usually shorter ones. So these are usually five to 10 questions focused on actions by the user. So instead of the other, the user research survey category focuses more on about the user themselves. This is more on the actions of the user. So we recommend aiming for five minutes or less to complete. So this would be something fairly quick, like, hey, can you take this quick five-minute survey? Depending on your market, you might get away with a little bit more, depending on if you have any incentives or if it's something that's, um, that makes sense and you're very clear of why you're doing this. You might be able to get away with a little bit more. But we recommend usually five minutes or less to aim for. Now, so you want to get a good mixture of open answer and closed answer questions. For getting on usage, you want to really know if they have a pain point, you want to know what that is. If you had a closed answer there, it might not give you enough information about what their frustration was. So if you have a product or maybe you have clients, you want to get some information from them about what their pain point was or what their frustration was or what they really liked about you. You want to get some actual text. So you want to have a handful of open answer questions if possible. But you also want to keep in mind that you want some closed answer questions so you can filter by that data. So for example, do I have, yeah. actually, let me go back one. Oh, sorry. So for example, with the closed answer, what we do is we can filter by, we have a question such as, how would you rate us on a 1 to 10 scale? Like You've probably seen a question like that by other products. Um, how likely are you re to recommend us 1 through 10? Things, something along that nature. And then so we can filter. We can go, hey, let's look at all the users who said 6 or less. And then we could filter by that and then look at all the open answers to those type of users. So I'd highly recommend using both, both open answer questions to get a lot of more information and then the closed answer ones to be able to filter by certain demographics or certain use cases. Now these I recommend usually doing maybe once a quarter or maybe um, three times a year. You could do two times a year if you have a, a, de um, a product or a service that doesn't change that much. And usually it's the fairly um, stagnant experience with you. 
But if you're maybe doing something such as products or um, various other aspects, you probably, they might have different experiences over time, so it'd be useful to get this a little bit more frequent. So example, in our case, this is an example question we use is how responsive has our support team been to your questions or concerns? And then what are three ways that we can improve whatever product or service that you're using? And then how likely are you to recommend us to a friend? Those are three great questions that most people end up usually using some version of that, depending on what you're doing. And what's great is if you have the very first one, how responsive has our team, that's a closed answer. Maybe you have like amazing, and then OK, and then bad, and then poor. And so you could filter by that and say, oh, well, show me all the bad, bad that they say it's fairly bad. And then we can look at some of the open answer questions based off that. And then what we do is since we do send this out once a quarter-ish, then we can filter this over time. So we can say, OK, how happy was everyone with our support team last time we did this, and compare that to this time we're doing it. And since it's closed answer, we can easily compare. We can see, oh, hey, people are more happy with their support team now, but they're not as happy as they were at the beginning of the year. So having those closed answers, we can kind of see how those are going over time. And then we can filter then based off what we need to improve to see those open answers to figure out what's going on. Is that yes? I've seen mixed research in this, um, because some people say having the less is um, it's m less likely they're just going to randomly click one. And then some research shows by having the full length, it's something that's so common, they know exactly what those numbers mean, the 1 to 10. So I've seen results that kind of go both ways. So there's nothing standard enough for me to really say one way or the other. Does that sort of answer the question? Any other questions on that so far? OK. So what are we going to do with this data? I already talked a little bit, but one was comparing time periods. So like I said before, you can compare how users feel about your brand or their experience with it between maybe the first quarter and the second quarter. And then you could filter more by questions. Like I said, um, on a couple examples, but this one is if we had our question of how many sites you use, we can say, well, let's see how everyone is, how happy are people that have one site versus people that manage you know, 10 sites. By having that as a closed one, we can filter by that to kind of see how different people are interacting with our brand based off some of their demographics. And then what's nice is that you can then share the, turn these into graphs and PDQ, PDFs and then share this maybe with members of your team or your clients or things along those lines. Or even if it's just yourself, sometimes it's nice to have just a PDF of these results. So it'd be, that's how we usually treat experience surveys. It's something that we do regularly. We can care, compare and contrast, generate some graphs and PDFs PDFs with, share it with our team. Sometimes we'll even post it on our website if it's good news. So things along those lines. Does that sort of make sense, the experience survey? OK. So pre-sale surveys. Now, I say the word sale here, but this could mean any conversion you're trying to do. If you're trying to get them to buy something, if you're trying to get them to sign up to something, or um, join a webinar, anything, it could be any sort of conversion. But they usually call these as pre-sale surveys. And what these are is you might have seen something along those lines. This is a tool called Hotjar, but it, you've probably seen this in a variety of different formats where you have a quick question if you try to leave the website or if you try to not do what they want you to do. So in this case, the one on the left says, is there anything preventing you from signing up at this point? And it's a quick closed answer. They just choose one real fast. And the one on the right is, do you have any questions before starting a free trial? And that one's more open answer. And so the difference here is that this will be very quickly, the one on the left, will be very quick for them to submit and choose one and then do whatever they're doing. And it's very quick you, if you have an idea of what the problems already are. If you're not sure what the situations may be, the one on the right is much more useful to get actual words and be like, oh, that's what a lot of people are having issues with. And then you could probably narrow it down into a closed answer from there. So usually when you do something like this, you would usually start with open answer and then move towards closed answer, depending on the problems or situations you're trying to solve with this type of question. So you wouldn't use both of those examples on the same No. No, you would be using one of these and preferably only on a certain part of your website. You wouldn't want it on every single if you have a store with 10 products, you wouldn't have that on every single product per se. So, and the goal of this is why didn't the why the customer didn't buy or why did the visitor not sign up to your mailing list or why did this person not join the webinar? Whatever you're trying to get them to do, 
That's the kind of data you're trying to get here is why do they not do the thing I want them to do. So these are usually quick. Um, think of one question type things. As you saw, both of the examples were one question. I've seen some that are two or three, but most people don't actually take the time to answer those. If they're not happy with your brand and they're leaving your website, they don't want to spend five minutes to tell you why. Right. So you want something that's very quick to answer. This is great for closed answer questions, like the example on the left that we, on the last slide. But you could get away with an open answer as long as it's something short you're asking them. But if you're asking for six paragraphs, they're not going to fill it out. So aim for one question, something that would take very fast for them to answer, and then move on. Now these are usually aimed, like I said, at people who may not buy. So a lot of the tools like Hotjar, the one on the screenshot from before, they have an option where you can say, hey, show this to people who are about to leave. And that's usually a good way. So a lot of the pop-up plugins you might have come across, um, Pop-up Maker and I want to say WP Pop-up, I think that's one. A lot of them have that, a similar option where it's exit intent or something along those lines. You would also maybe have it there as well. Yes? I'm looking at, the, at this uh, particular slide with personal experience. It's like, OK, what if for whatever reason, I'm not going to pursue. I'm not going to give you my email address. I'm not going to opt in, whatever. And at that point, it's like, I'm done here. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, So I don't care to answer any of your questions. So yeah. And then I guess that's just affirming what you just said. I may or may not click on that one yeah, click response. You know, it's like, I'm done. With, for whatever reason, I'm not interested, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. And typically, you're not going to get every use visitor to fill out the survey. That's just that's not going to be realistic. Across the board, you could expect maybe 10 to 20%, and that's even still high. Yeah, that's but cool. still, if you have you know, a couple hundred people come across your website, that'd still be 10 to 20 people who've answered sure. it. And that might be enough information to go, oh, I need to change how this is worded, or maybe this product doesn't make sense. They're getting confused here, so I can add something here. It could be my landing page or my offer. Yeah, exactly. It could be your offer itself. Like, hey, do you have any questions here? Why are you sent? And everyone has a question because they don't understand your pricing. Right. So then you're like, oh, OK. You know, after you get five responses, you understand there's a pricing issue. Yeah. So you usually don't need that much. But it's nice to get as much as you can. But realistically, if you get 20%, I would be amazed if you had it that high. Yeah, exactly. So, and like I said, it's you want to try to display it after a user has been on the page for a little while and they're about to leave. A lot of um, products call this exit intent, so that's a phrase you might have come across if you use a pop-up plugin or the Hotjar tool or anything along those lines that enable this. Usually, the term exit intent, or sometimes they'll just say when the user's about to leave or something to that effect. Yeah, politicians would call that your exit hole. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> So a couple example questions that we've had success with. Um, this one, just implying that it would be quick to answer. So we sometimes start with just a quick question. If you decided not to buy today, what stopped you? If you could change just one thing on this page, what would it be? That was a really popular one when we ran that one. Um, we got a lot of interesting feedback. Not all super helpful, but um, a lot of them were. So that was an interesting one to play around with. Does our pricing structure make sense to you? And this one we tried as close answer, yes or no. And we tried as open answer, just to get feedback. Um, it was nice as a yes and no, so we could quickly see, oh, most people found this useful. or most. But the, close answer, the open answer was also useful to kind of get information of why they were confused. So we kind of bounced between the both. Um, I'm not convinced either way is better than the other. Both of them were useful, close and open, on that particular one. So if you go to implement that, I would probably suggest playing with both to see if you can get the information that you need. Well, probably not. But you know, the, what if someone comes across and they're like, yeah, I sort of get it, but I'm still a little. Bit, maybe yes or no wouldn't be enough for them. So maybe having a, a maybe or I'm not sure or something would still be beneficial in this case. Another one that we like to use is, what was your biggest fear or concern about, from, about purchasing from us? That one we got a lot of interesting feedback for. And then the last one is, what's the one thing we're missing in product or service or something along those lines. So maybe you get a lot of people who come to your site and maybe you're selling a service. And they're scrolling through and they're like, oh, if only they did this. And you actually did that. And if, uh, so a lot of people enter that into the box. You'd be like, oh, I need to highlight this more. I need to move this up and make this more apparent. That's useful information to know how to craft maybe your landing page or your offer or your product page or webinar, whatever the case may be. That question we got a lot of insights from. Does that sort of make sense? Have I confused anyone so far? All right, so opposite of pre-sale then would be the post-sale. 
So again, it doesn't have to be selling. It could be just conversion. You're trying to get them to sign up. It could be a webinar, whatever the case may be. So this one, um, our example here is on the left, the one we're currently using today. So this would be after they did whatever you wanted them to do. So if you wanted them to buy something, this would be maybe on their purchase confirmation page. Or if you wanted them to sign up for your email list, this might be on the thank you page. It would be whatever after they did what you wanted them to do. You're trying to get insights as to what made them or what led them to actually do it. So, and this actually, across all of the things we do, this tends to get our highest conver conversion rate. We, some months will average almost 20% conversion rate, which if you're in marketing at all, you know that's an astronomical conversion rate. Most like sign-up lists and things average around 2 or 3%, and a lot of other surveys we do average around 5 to 10%. So getting a 20% conversion rate is amazing. Now, we say aim for less than three. A lot of um, users of our product have two or three questions. And they seem to be going OK. But in our experience, when we tested our own site, the one question got us the most response. And that's what we want. We want to get as much information as possible. So this particular question, quick question, what persuaded you to make your purchase today? And of all the variations we tested, this gets us the most information. And since they just purchased from us, theoretically, they're happy about us. They like our product. They, so sometimes they'll sit there and type an entire paragraph. And we can use that going, oh, a lot of people phrased it this way. So we'll add that back to our marketing page, which helps more people end up buying. So that question we've gotten lots of insights from. And a lot of time, we've reworded sections of our website based on what people put into that question. Oh, wait. Sorry. That very last point is very important. If you do have some sort of process where you're going to use pre-sale or post-sale surveys, only use one. Don't use both. We tested it. And we, a lot of people got angry. They do not want to see post-sale surveys pop in, or pre-sale surveys popping up and then post-sale surveys. We had a lot of people get very angry at that. And they're very vocal. Don't, don't use both. Use one or the other. And then you could switch between it. If you want to try to improve uh, maybe your purchase page or subscribe to our webinar page, you can use some pre-sale pre ones for a little bit and then get some data and then use some post-sale ones. You can alternate. What are they? Just don't use both at the same time. So a couple example questions. Yeah, sure. Go back up just one second, Frank. I thought that the, the main thrust of the pre-sale uh, survey was why did you not buy? Yes. So if they did not buy, why would they ever see the post-sale? Well, so in a scenario, and this happens quite a bit, so they maybe they're doing some research and they're trying to decide the right product. So they have a lot of product pages open. And they go to close yours a couple times. They'll see this pre-sale one maybe three or four times, and then after they buy it, they see it. So that's. I got you. It doesn't happen that much, but it happens enough, and the users that it does happen to get really, fr really frustrated. Okay, that so that's, that you just want to avoid it as much as possible. So a couple example questions that we played around with that have we found success with. Um, that's the one that I just showed in the screenshot. That's the one we're using today. And then this is another one we used. Um, if you have a moment, can you t let us know how did you find out about us? So if you want to get a little bit more insights into how people that are buying are finding you, that would be a good one to play around with. What nearly stopped you from completing your purchase? This was a fun one, because we got a lot of good feedback that was slightly negative, if that makes any sense. So they would be like, oh, well, I was really hesitant. Maybe your support wasn't fast enough, or I wasn't sure if this was going to work, but we're so. So you find a lot of um, things that were like, that you, if you address a little bit more in your marketing page, you could convince the people that didn't buy for that same reason to actually buy. So that was a really helpful question that we played around with. And the last one is just your simple 1 to 10 one. This is great as a closed. Close answer so you can kind of keep track of satisfaction over time of people who are buying from you or whatever the case may be that you're trying to get them to do. Does that sort of make sense? Does anyone have questions on that? Uh, this is just really, really big. I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued with the, uh, with the granularity here. I mean, for numbers geeks, I mean, this is, you know, analytical type. On that last one, did you happen to split test? Um, with 10 being the best, what would you rate us, or how would you rate us if you split test those? I did not split test that particular phrasing. Okay. Um, I'm not I, surprised with the level of detail you put in all the rest of I split test almost everything, but that particular phrasing okay. I did not split test. It, in theory, I don't think you would see that much of a difference, yeah. mainly because of the conversion rates of already how the post-sale survey is. Right, right. But it would be worth testing if you went down that road. I was just curious, because I mean, I'm, I'm just amazed at the level of detail that you know about this. Well, just that 
our, one of my main products is a survey tool, so we do help a lot of people. So that gives me abilities to test a lot of different questions out. So when it comes to post-sale, I've already mentioned a couple how we use this data a little bit, but just to clarify, um, one of the things is look for possible problems that customers encountered. So if you have a lot of open answer, they might have a lot of feedback of, oh, well, I was really confused by this, or I wasn't sure if it's going to work for this, or your pricing didn't make any sense. So those would be some things that you could reincorporate into fixing maybe technically or clarifying on your marketing pages or your marketing emails. Look for indication that the product is not a good fit for the customer. So a lot of people, um, if you have done anything with marketing before, you know finding the right customer and getting them to buy a product is a lot easier than finding the wrong customer and trying to get them to buy a product. So you can see based on what some of these questions of, oh, hey, who, how did they find us? Are they a good fit? Um, what could we have, how could we have worded the pages or our marketing better to, to attract more of this type of person versus that type of person? And that's a, the, this survey is very good for those type of cases. And then you can review data regularly for any immediate changes that need to be made. So if you suddenly have, if you usually have positive ratings and you have good, interesting feedback, and then all of a sudden you have a lot of really bad feedback and various insights, that might be something, hey, we did something differently that isn't working out too well, or we did something recently and it broke something. Use, monitoring this data regularly will be helpful for that. So for example, our post-sale survey, we use a tool to aggregate all the results, and once a week we get emailed all the results from our post-sale survey. So that way we can kind of monitor it regularly to see if there's any insights that we need to act upon fairly quickly. And then again, review over time to test changes. So before I've talked multiple times about filtering data based on maybe time period or things along those lines, it would still be useful even for post-sale surveys as well. So a couple of tools I want to mention to, that you can use to do something like this. So Hotjar is one of my favorite ones. Uh, they do have a free plan. I think they still have a free plan uh, that you can use, and it would be your single site, and you can have maybe post-sale surveys or pre-sale surveys. Is that little pop-up for a couple of times I screenshotted that little green, or I'm sorry, little gray box, that was Hotjar. And you can have um, closed questions, like a multiple choice. You can have an open answer. What's nice about Hotjar is that it also includes some heat maps and user recordings. Well outside of the scope of this talk, but those are useful that this tool would also include as well. Now, if you're looking for something more of the user research or experience surveys, your usual survey monkey that I'm sure a lot of you have encountered before, uh, that one's great. It, they do have a free plan. The issue with them <coughs> is that they wouldn't be something you would use for post-sale or pre-sale, because that would be difficult to implement, and then it wouldn't be super user-friendly the ways that you would do it. So depending on how you're doing, you might end up using both. You might only use one, depending on what type of surveys you're creating. SurveyMonkey is great, because you can just send people to a link to do it. So if you're sending out emails and trying to get people to do a user research email or experience survey email, it's nice because SurveyMonkey gives you a URL that you can include in your emails. Same thing with social media, things along those lines. It's a nice place you can send them to, whereas Hotjar, it would be something on your site. So if you're trying to get people to go somewhere to do something, you'd have to tell them, oh, well, go to this page and then look for the little pop-up in the corner and then that wouldn't really be the best way. So depending on what survey you're trying to do, one of these two tools would be a use useful one. Now, form plugins, a lot of you maybe have used um, either Caldera Forms, WP, Ninja Forms. You might have used um, Captain Forms. You might have used Gravity Forms. There's a lot of great form plugins out there. And a lot of these, depending on what type of surveys you're doing, what type of data you're trying to collect, some of the form plugins you may have already be using might be useful still to do it that way. So for example, um, the, the post-sale survey, if you're just trying to get an open answer question, almost any form plugin could build a, te a text box question type. So you just you know, go to Gravity Forms or Ninja Forms or Codelayer Forms and create a simple form with a single question and embed that somewhere to do your post-sale or your pre-sale surveys. So those would be another great tool that many of you may already be using. And then lastly, mainly because you know, it is mine, I do at least have to mention it, Quiz and Survey Master does, also does a lot of these as well. So between all these tools, some of, a lot of the time, most people already are using either SurveyMonkey or a form plugin. So you could probably already go out and build a lot of the things we've talked about so far using just something that may be already on your website. Does anyone have questions on tools or anything along those lines? How you would maybe implement some of the things we've talked about? OK. Well, um, something that would be very helpful, since this is a newer talk, is if you would tweet and just say something you found useful in this talk so that I can make sure I continue to improve it. That would be very helpful. If you have Twitter, if you don't, 
you can ignore this slide, but it would be very helpful. Thank you. And then last but not least, any questions that I can answer about? I know we went over a lot of different stuff. There's a lot to go over in a short period of time. But is there any questions that I can help answer or clarify for anyone? Yes. So remember back in the user bias section? Mm -hmm. A lot of people will see a question like that and be like, oh, well, what are they going to do with this data? Or how are they going to see? So you can, by having it, you just have to be careful of how you, how you phrase it and being required or not and clarifying what you're going to do with it. If people see an email field and they don't entirely trust you, it couldn't um, lead them to not submit the survey. So you, in order to make sure people submit the survey, you want to either not use it or use it and just make sure it's not required or be very careful. Like, we're not going to share this with anyone. It's just for us to reach out if we need to help. Something along, those, uh, something along that effect, as long as it's very clear what you're using it for and maybe it's not required, it should not hurt the data. But if it is required and it's not clear, it would hurt your data. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Just like preface it with optional. Yeah, definitely. Just, I, usually I would say, um, a lot of times when I do something like that, I'm like, um, if you're interested, would you be willing to do this, blah, blah, and then have like an email field and then just be like, hey, we're not going to share this with anyone. This would be only used for this case. And that seems to work well in the times we've experimented with it. So I haven't seen a, a big issue, but it would definitely be an issue if you just kind of put it there with no information and made it required. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes. I have. I've done, the, I've done a bit of testing, and we've tested both. Having it on the purchase confirmation had a better conversion rate than through the email. So at least on the tests that we've done, we, d we tested the one question that we've narrowed it down to. And I would imagine the results will be the same regardless of the number of questions. But in our case, it was almost 3 to 4% higher conversion rate on the page as opposed to the email. And our theory is that when you're there, you're looking at the like, purchase confirmation, and you already see it, you type it in. When you get an email, a lot of people get a lot of email. So they're like, oh, we'll get back to that later, and they never do. So in our case, our testing showed that having it on the page was much more beneficial. Yes? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on when and how to use incentives. So it's really tricky, because it really depends on your industry and what you're trying to do. So um, something that through our testing, we found the more relevant the incentive is to your demographic, the more likely it will actually matter. So for example, if I, was, if I ran a site for cat users and I was creating content, if I said, hey, if you sign up, we'll send you a free iPad, okay, it probably won't be that big, but maybe this free app or something along those lines, that might not appeal to them, so it won't really help regardless of dollar amount. So I found in our testing, sometimes we would do something that's like $20 value, maybe a, like a raffle drawing or something along those lines, and our testing, a $5 item that was more relevant saw better conversions. So it's not always the dollar amount that matters. It's how relevant it is to your demographic. And the testing we've done, uh, usually across the board, incentives help. It just, as long as it's relevant, and depending on how you implement it. So it's, um, if, you, if you had the budget to go, every person gets a $5 gift card, that would be amazing. But no one, most people don't have that kind of budget. So it's usually some sort of maybe enter into a raffle, and then having something very clear of how that's going to process will help conversions as opposed to something that's less clear. Does that sort of answer your question? That's helpful, yeah. Okay. Any other questions that I can answer? We're just about out of time. All right, great. Thank you so much. I hope this was beneficial. And you guys have a wonderful day.